So, hi everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the Biome Podcast with me, Emma, Roby, and Kate. And this week, as per usual, we're going to talk about something really controversial, um, because that seems to be a theme. Um, we're gluttons for punishment. <laughs> we do this to ourselves, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's all good. All in the name of conservation. Um, mm. And so today we're going to be talking about whether we should legalise the rhino horn trade or not. And with this one interesting, I think we don't all agree um so you don't have to either we're curious to see what you think by the end of this um but yeah kate do you want to kick us off tell us about sort of an overview of what's going on with with rhino horn yeah so we're going to be talking about um international trade in rhino horn um and the reason obviously this is ever discussed and kind of the main reason people ever talk about rhinos is because of the poaching crisis so Rhinos have been extensively poached for their horns, um, which we will kind of delve into a lot of detail about in a minute. But just to give an overview of the poaching and why it's such a huge problem. So according to Save the Rhino International, which is a kind of massive international rhino organisation, I'm sure most of you have heard of it. Over a thousand rhinos were poached annually in South Africa alone between 2013 and 2017. And on average, a rhino is poached once every 15 hours. That's so in the last decade, Africa has lost nearly 10,000 rhinos to poaching, which is a lot when you're talking about a species that is not that abundant. Like these are endangered. Mm. Every, all the species of rhino are endangered to some extent. And so these numbers are incredibly high in relation to the overall abundance of the of the animals. Save the Rhino International estimates that 769 um, rhinos were poached in 2018 and 594 in 2019, um, which is less, obviously, than the numbers I just said, but this decline isn't necessarily good news. The long-term impacts of poaching are likely to be taking their toll and there are a smaller population means that... I hadn't thought about there that. There are quite a, yeah. <laughs> less rhinos to poach. Um, oh, that's a horrible thing to say, isn't Yeah, it? Um, so it is good to see a downward trend in poaching because, you know it is still good to see but it doesn't necessarily mean that the species is recovering so rhinos are poached for their horns which is largely to supply an asian market and the two biggest countries of demand are china and vietnam historically china was the larger market but now vietnam has potentially surpassed china in being the largest market of rhino horn the main two reasons that people buy rhino horn are firstly for uses in traditional medicine and secondly as a kind of status symbol um much like ivory um you can buy rhino horn statues or to put on your mantelpiece stuff like that traditional chinese medicine believes that rhino horn has medicinal powers um including the power to cure cancer work as viagra um, and also for just general use and kind of less extreme illnesses like fevers, um, also relieving symptoms of arthritis, headaches, etc. Um, and sometimes it's actually mixed with other medicines. Um, so you can actually buy paracetamol that has rhino horn mixed in and then it's sold oh, wow. at a higher price because it's therefore more valuable. But actually yeah. it's then you've actually got less paracetamol. <laughs> So, yeah, because the rhino horn is taking up. Yeah. So, so, so is there any scientific basis there as to rhino horn being effective for treating these things or not? No. Um, if you're talking about kind of Western science and Western medicine, there's been no proof that rhino horn possesses medicinal value. Um, it's not harmful. It doesn't hurt you to ingest it, but it doesn't help you. It d- doesn't really do anything. Uh, rhino horn is made of keratin, so it's the same... Um, substance as your fingernails and your hair it's basically compact hair um so it would be pretty much the same really unpleasant yeah it is gross (laughs) it's be the same as literally grinding up your fingernails and putting that in some paracetamol um so you know my fingers are now feeling a bit you know yeah i know yeah yeah um (laughs) so yeah there's it's there's no evidence to suggest it would do any of those things I just mentioned. Um, it definitely feels like a scam, especially when they are mixing it in with other medicines, so s- selling weaker medicine and at a higher price. 
So it's currently illegal to trade in rhino horn internationally. However, there are some countries where you can trade internally in rhino horn. But we're going to kind of just run through the history of the rhino horn trade. So in 1977, under the CITES Appendix 1, CITES being the... Um, what is it? Convention... CITES being the Convention of International Trade of Endangered Species, and they ranked... <laughs> we can never remember CITES. <laughs> yeah. CITES had their three appendices, and the lower appendix means more restrictions on trade. So in 1997, rhinos were listed under Appendix 1, so there was no trade in rhino horns or their parts allowed. In 1995, the white rhino was downlisted under CITES to Appendix 2 for the South African populations, as the numbers had recovered well, and this amendment allowed for the live animals to be traded for hun- and for hunting trophies to be exported. Um, unfortunately, the white rhino in South Africa was the only rhino population that recovered and did not decline. So white rhinos in other places didn't recover and other rhino species also did not recover. Whilst international trade... I think, I, isn't that... that's Sorry, that's just that's the quite shocking thing with the... Because uh, didn't they go from like under 500 mm-hmm. to over a couple thousand... And it's one of those really interesting moments where you think, oh, great, they're surviving. But 99% of those 10,000 rhinos are all in South Africa and yeah. everywhere else they're hammered. And that recovery, just to kind of quickly go into it, was due to immense conservation efforts. Mm. Um, it was coined Operation Rhino, which was spearheaded by the late Dr. Ian Player. And he pretty much brought them back from the brink. And it was an incredible operation. And they basically used innovative methods to transport rhinos it was this mass translocation program to move rhinos around and get them to safety and also get them mixing and it was incredible it was just this huge project that did incredibly well so it wasn't that the rhinos just recovered like there was a lot of conservation work that went into that um which allowed for this just kind of unforeseen boom in the population which was absolutely incredible important to note um in terms of trade is whilst international trade um, is illegal individual countries are able to determine their own laws um, in order to allow or prohibit the sale of rhino horn domestically so mm-hmm. the trade we're talking about today is international which has to be governed by cites when black rhinos were listed as appendix one in 1977 there were s- still more than 50,000 left today however they are critically endangered africa has lost 96 percent of their black rhinos between 1970 and 1992 and there's now roughly about 5,000, which is quite an optimistic wow. estimate that's huge drop yeah um, and that's you know it's not just it's not just the value of that animal as an icon but if you know you know we talk in our podcast so much about ecosystem value and how each animal has a role within the ecosystem losing that many mega herbivores you know losing that ability to plow through the brush and dig up the water holes and seed transpersal and stuff like that it must be really having a devastating effect on african ecosystems i would imagine yeah it's really it's really sad for those yeah ecologically it's a massive loss and culturally it's a huge loss because it's Mm. an incredibly iconic species obviously the black rhino is you know part of the big five and rhinos have been on this earth for 50 million years so it's it's a really hard decline to watch. In other countries in Africa, we've kind of seen the same problem. So in Swaziland, the rhino war, uh, so-called rhino war, lasted from 1988 to 1992. Um, and during this time, the country lost 80% of its rhino population to poachers. Um, Botswana had less than 20 rhinos in 1992, and the black rhino was locally extinct. Tanzania numbers of both species have declined drastically over the last 50 years. There are approximately 10,000 black rhinos in Tanzania in the 60s, but by the, uh, 1984 there were only 3,000, and by 1990 there were less than 100 black rhinos left in Tanzania. So we've wow. kind of seen the same trend of just massive decline. And this is predominantly poaching. Um, yeah. 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 So. Rhino poaching figures in South Africa actually remained relatively low, um, rarely reaching double figures prior to 2008. Um, So although this correlation might suggest that the trade ban was effective, um, because this was when it was illegal to trade in rhino horn, it is more likely that South Africa's population remained stable because other African states were having their rhino populations decimated to feed the demand. So South Africa kind of became this sort of haven for rhinos, 
but other, but rhinos were being poached everywhere else so there wasn't this decline in poaching seen worldwide it was just sort of seen in south africa mm-hmm. so 20 years ago in 1992 um a number of 30 years ago oh my gosh 30 years ago in 1992 um <laughs> that's <was> sad um <laughs> a number of um african rhino states proposed proposed a legal controlled trade in rhino horn as their rhino populations were being poached for an illegal trade. However, their proposal was rejected. And following this rejected proposal, alternative options were suggested, which included undertaking a trade study of the market in horn, launching educational and awareness campaigns in consumer countries, so in kind of China and Vietnam, to warn them of the effects of the demands and to kind of negate the medical effectiveness of horn. And they wanted to enlist media support with these campaigns and really push this kind of educational message. Other kind of alternatives were to really severely punish offenders in rhino poaching and trafficking and to increase anti-poaching methods. So to make poaching really undesirable as well as to try and kind of kill the demand in the kind of consumer countries. And all of these suggestions are I mean, I think that's kind of highlights like, Mm. oh, sorry, just saying that kind of that shows what you need is that kind of multiple approach system if you are going to try and tackle this it's not just the demand but you have to consider the supply as well i think it's all really linked yeah definitely and all of these suggestions are valuable and raise important issues related to the rhino poaching crisis in order for an international trade to be legalized rhino horn must be downlisted by cites So a downlisting proposal may only be submitted to CITES at a convention of the parties, a kind of COP summit, um, which are currently being held every three years. The proposal must achieve a two thirds majority in favour and there are 176 member parties of CITES. Um, So in order for a species to be downlisted, two thirds of the majority must agree. Um, So this kind of shows that the rhino poaching crisis is a kind of global issue because, you know, the UK doesn't have rhinos, gets to vote at CITES whether international trade is legalised, as does every other country outside of Africa and Asia. In 2016, Swaziland proposed an international trade in two kind of downlist rhinos so that you could tra- legally trade at CITES at the Convention of the Parties, which was held in South Africa, I think. I think it was in Johannesburg. Um, but it failed to pass the two thirds majority. So that's kind of where we're at today. We've got a ban on international trade, some countries domestically trading, some countries wanting to downlist rhinos. Obviously, Swaziland proposed it. They were outvoted. And we've seen this kind of history of back and forth of legalizing and not legalizing trade, but largely a massive decline in rhino populations. And some people thinking this is Swaziland being one of them the way to go and the Swaziland proposal just a bit of context within Africa some African countries supported Swaziland others did not so Africa itself was quite divided and NGOs were also quite split on the issue and I so that's really interesting to kind of understand where we are now I think I'll just give a little bit of a glow a global rhino perspective also it allows me to slip yeah. in with some <laughs> taxonomy and evolution <laughs> because you know i will slip in taxonomy <laughs> and evolution wherever i can take it away um, and yeah hopefully this will just provide a little bit of a kind of overview of how much we've already lost in kind of ecological terms as well as just the numbers game so there are five species of rhinoceros alive today fingers crossed uh you've got the black and the white in africa you've got the indian in mainland asia and you've got the sumatran and the javan on the islands of Sumatra and Java, you guessed it, well done, <laughs> respectively. Um, although it is important to note that historically the Indian Sumatran and Javan all used to overlap. Sumatran and Javan rhinos used to spread over all of Southeast Asia on the mainland as well before they were wiped out there. Um, so to give kind of, yeah, to give an idea of how the poaching crisis has impacted each species individually. So the white rhino, which is the largest species of rhino, um, although interestingly there are some some people think the Indian rhino is the same size but they're different proportions it's quite hard to compare um, of the two subspecies of white rhino only the southern subspecies can be truly considered numerous there's around 18,000 individuals alive wild individuals so that's good yeah. again the vast majority of those are in South Africa so there is a skew there of the northern subspecies they've received a lot of attention recently because only two females remain rendering the subspecies functionally extinct unless uh, functionally extinct in the wild certainly unless you know innovative technologies can restore them um 
The black rhino, unlike the white rhino, has a lot more subspecies. I'm just going to count them because I had to write them down because <laughs> I couldn't keep them all in my head. You've got the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You've got eight subspecies of black rhino. Wow. Two of which, the, sub- the western and the southern, are already extinct as a result of rampant poaching. Uh, so is the northeastern. Also, it's actually, sorry, three sp- subspecies are already extinct. The Chobe and Ugandan subspecies are teetering on the verge. No one knows how many left in the wild. The Chobe subspecies is thought to be down to just one in Chobe National Park. And the wow. Ugandan subspecies, there's been no surveys. Um, and so there's only three subspecies which have any viability. The eastern, the south central and the southwestern. So just to give a you know perspective, you, it's very easy to say that we've lost all these black rhinos. But that kind of gives new meaning when you realise you've already lost evolutionarily distinct lineages, which can't be brought back. Um, the, t- the story is also dire in Asia. So of the Asian rhinos, only the Indian can be considered to be truly viable with around 3,700 wild individuals. A bit like the white rhino, that it was a, it was a massive conservation success story. It was down to, I think, 200. And there was this wow. massive conservation initiative which, which brought them back. Yay! We love Marianne. Yay. Yeah. 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 yeah! Some positive Great. news. <laughs> positive news. Well, you're not going to like this. Um, <laughs> oh, no. So the Javan rhino, which used to range across all of Southeast Asia, uh, now has only 60 individuals in a single national park in Indonesia, Ujong Kulong National Park. Cool um, name for it's... a national park. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say that that um, is incredibly problematic that um, all yeah. of them are in a single national park because it would just take oh, yeah. one catastrophic event and the entire species would be gone. So one... And in, in fact, that national park is on the coast mm-hmm. and has been threatened three times in the last few years by tsunamis. Yeah. So that's, no, that's, that's scary. Really worrying, which is why the Operation Rhino translocation project, I think, was so successful because obviously translocations, mm. as we've spoken about, amazing for genetic diversity and stuff, but... Having all your eggs in one basket, it's not going to work. It's very scary. Yeah. And we've, again, with the Javan rhino, they had three subspecies. Only one, the Javan nominate subspecies, is left. The Indian subspecies is certainly extinct. The Vietnamese subspecies is almost certainly. You hear the odd rumours coming out of the Indonesian jungle, but it's we're talking tuppence here. The Sumatran rhino, again, numbers are tantalisingly obscure. We don't know. We've got no solid estimate. It's thought to be fewer than 80. Some estimates take that as low as fewer than 30. We're lucky with the Sumatran rhino. We've got about eight individuals in captivity. Um, But of the two, two of the Sumatran rhino's three subspecies, the mainland and the Bornean, are functionally extinct in the world. So again... It's easy to say we've lost all these rhinos, but we're also losing lineages here, which I think is is quite important to stress. Um, so, sorry, that was just a really depressing... Rhinos are getting hammered. Um, so if we're going to talk about a trade in these species, which, you know, might seem quite counterintuitive, having just heard that rhinos being hammered as they are, what are we talking about when we talk about this legal trade? Yeah, no, I think it's good to clear that up because people might be so confused how you can legally... Um, trade these species Mm. we just talked about all this rampant poaching so basically why this is different with rhinos and we aren't having this conversation with with ivory with elephants is because rhino horn like you said kate is made of keratin um and it's the structure on the face and it can be sawed off and it grows back kind of like your fingernails so there is a possibility there that it could be removed sustainably Mm. um sort of and you could let it grow over the course of a year um and then you can remove the majority of the horn without cutting the face um and so i think that's a difference to highlight there when it's illegal um sort of poaching of of wild rhinos the poachers tend to sort of just hack off the majority of the face because that enables them to access as much of the horn as possible which is horrible like so you cut it back right to the back of the face and the animals are bleeding it's it's really really horrible same way with ivory that we talked about in a previous podcast it's just it, it kills the animal basically um and so one rhino would only give you one horn if you're doing it illegally um but if you have vets that are doing it say with a chainsaw you can just um shave the horn above the base trim it leave this sort of stub behind and then that can 
um, grow back and be removed annually or every two years as it as it grows yeah um, I, I think a, a comparison if you're kind of struggling to visualize this is it's kind of the difference between cutting your hair or chopping your head off so <laughs> I mean, that sounds ridiculous but if you get your hair cut or even shave your head you're removing your hair and it will hopefully grow back and you can do it again and have more hair if you cut your head off you're gonna die obviously but whoever has your head now has every single follicle of hair from your head so they're gonna have more hair than if you just shaved it off but that is it they're never gonna get any more hair from that individual but if you shave your head you can keep shaving your head as many times as you like throughout your lifetime and you will end up with more hair in the end so I think that's kind of the difference because one way you die and you produce <laughs> no more hair, one way you live, you have slightly less hair in that one harvest, but you will eventually end up with more hair. And I imagine when we talk about this legal trade, we, we, we at least in this conversation are going to focus on the two African species and pr- predominantly the, the white rhino- southern white rhinoceros, which is the most numerous, 18,000 they think in the wild. Um, you, there's no way this could be applied to Javan and Sumatran rhinos because there's barely any left and they live in an impenetrable swamp. Indian rhinos, I, you know, there's a there's nearly 4,000. Maybe you could do it, but again, I'm not sure how the feasibility of that because, again, they live in these big riverine forested ecosystems, harder to get to than the bush. Um, they're very cryptic species. Um but we're, yeah, again, to kind of give you some more context to this debate, we're kind of framing it as we're going to look at white rhino farming and wild harvesting. And that's, again, why we're kind of focusing on the two African species, because you couldn't, I don't think you could really wild harvest with the Asian ones, and I don't think you could rhino farm the Asian ones. But I guess to highlight, there's that link there. So mm. if there was a legal trade, it would be largely from the African species. So that yeah. would be where the supply is coming from, and then the demand would be in Asia. So there's still that, that link there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the rhino farming option is kind of the one which talk, which is talked about quite a lot. It's Emma's going to tell us a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and so it basically involves keeping a large number of rhinos in an enclosure. Think what we do with cattle um, and systematically and humanely removing their horns on an annual basis or every other year. Um, it would be resource intensive. It would require a lot of land because, you know, these are rhinos we're talking about. <laughs> Big ones can weigh almost two tons. They need a lot of food, a lot of land, a lot of space. You need to supplementary feed them. Um, but that's the kind of idea of what rhino farming, of rhino farming that we have in, in our mind. You'd kind of keep them as livestock and you would sustainably harvest from them each year. The rhinos would be fine. They wouldn't die. And so it's not so much of a waste as you would killing one rhino. You could conceivably, over the lifetime of one rhino, harvest much more horn than just killing it in any one time would, 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 would produce. Um and, you know, there are issues, as I kind of said, you know, you've resource intensive land. Black rhinos in particular are territorial. Um, you can't keep them at a 50-50 sex ratio. Um, you know, the, the the model which comes out a lot is you'd keep two fe- males for every 18 females. Well, what are you going to do with all the males which are born? Um, and so the other side of that is wild harvesting, um, which is where, you know, you don't keep the rhinos in captivity. They roam wild and you go out and it's, it's it would usually be the game wardens or the national park people who go out and trim the horns. Um, and that would be used to supply the trade. Um, and so, yeah, there are ethical considerations with both and there are ecological considerations with both as well. Um, I think first, should we go into a bit more depth of how rhino farming would work? I'd like to know a bit more about that. Yeah, I think it's good to look at... Um... An example of this, but so interesting what you were saying with kind of the sort of cattle-like farming conditions versus wild harvesting. I think with this example, there's, it's a blurred line between the two because people who have visited, so it's this man called John Hume and he owns the most rhinos of any private owner in the world. He has over a thousand of them on his land. And wow. um, how much land does he have? <laughs> a lot. Because people who have been there, so there's, a, there's this man who visited and he did a podcast about it. Um, and he said he struggled to find the rhinos on the land when he was there. Like you, you don't see them because there's that much space. So it's like, where does where do you draw the line between, yes, they're captive, but there's a, mm. so much space that they can just do whatever they want. 
Um, have, have, have you been there, Kate? Because I know I, you've spent so quite a bit of time in South Africa. Yeah, I have actually been there. Um, and I, I did see a lot of rhinos, but the first day especially, yeah, they're not just everywhere you look. It's not like a cattle farm where there's a field with 50 cows in and you can see them all at once. So you do have to go and drive around and look for them and you could be driving for ages. It, he has other animals as well. So you, it's almost like being on safari because he keeps antelope as well. Um, he has a dam there as well that's got hippos and things so you can just kind of go on almost a game drive and try and find the rhinos so that, I think it's it sounds like a, I mean it is a lot of rhinos it's a, over a thousand yeah. rhinos is a huge number especially <laughs> it's you know an 18th of the population almost but um yeah. yes it's not like you can't they're not just dotted around everywhere you do he has a, a it, huge amount of space I don't know exactly how much I don't know if he's ever declo- it's disclosed exactly how much space it, so it, it it's not like a battery farm because when no, i started reading about rhino farming that was the image i was like a big shed full of rhinos chopping the horns off and i kind of thought oh that's a bit yeah no not at all it's definitely not a battery farm it's not a factory farm it's not um it's a farm in the sense that it's at land and it's managed space i think the word farm has a slightly different mm-hmm. meaning um to kind of British or maybe European people, yeah. we think of chickens, pigs, cows, and yeah, we think of, you know, you, you take them out in the day and then you bring them back in at night. Whereas farm in kind of Australia and a lot of African countries is just <laughs> your space, yes, it's <laughs> your <laughs> outdoor space. Um, yeah. A lot of people, people with like reserve managers who work on nature reserves refer to them as the farm. Um, yeah. And they're like, oh, I'm on the farm today, or this is the farm, or like, that's the boundary of the farm. And they mean to us they mean for them the farm that's what it means but for us in our heads we think no you mean nature reserve so so it's it's similar almost to ranch in, yes in the states where yeah they've got these massive and they ride about on horses and it takes mm. two days to get to one end to another yeah that sort of that's sort that's a good yeah. comparison actually because we don't really have something comparable in the uk um we don't have yeah. <laughs> ranch yeah it's more of a i mean ranch. i think a key difference there is also that the this is privately owned land um, mm. So that is kind of what I, it's a privately owned land that has a fence is basically how I describe John Hume's area of <laughs> land, whatever you want to call it. Um, because a point to make, make interestingly with that like sort of comparison between privately owned land and national parks is that most rhinos aren't on private land, even though a thousand rhinos mm. is a significant number. Most of them are in national parks like Kruger. They found that parks are holding three quarters of rhino but actually they account for 90 percent of the poaching that goes on whereas private owners wow. ho- hold a quarter of rhino but that's only 10 percent of poaching so there's a huge um that's difference there so so the point the point the, the end point of that is rhinos in private reserves are safer than those in national parks which is so weird to the mindset of i don't know maybe our mindset as brits who when you know if you go to south africa you might only visit national parks Mm. like that's so that seems so weird to me that they're actually safer in private hands than in national parks i think it's so backwards as well that it's like the national parks are supposed to be these areas of kind of free Mm. land where sort of they're allowed to display Mm. their natural behaviors but i think a key thing with private ownership is they can afford to spend a lot more on on protection. So just yeah. as a scale to give you some costs, like John Hume was talking about the cost that he spends on a monthly basis, and it's insane. So basically this project is costing five million a month. So I assume this is, um, what's Rand. the currency? Rand, yeah. Yeah, so, um, Rand. so that's, uh, let me do some quick maths. Carry on talking. <laughs> quick maths. <laughs> yeah, so five million a month. And two million of that is going to just supplies for the project, and three million is going towards security. So they have like Blimey. patrolling vehicles, helicopters that fly at night, early warning systems. Like this is an expensive operation, so you can see why they're safer. Wow. Yeah, and you and you can you kind of if you're a private owner and you own these rhinos, it's your money on the line. Yeah. It's your livelihood. It's your interest. So you've got much more of an incentive to actually provide adequate security and, pr- and protect these animals i think yeah so five million rand is about two hundred fifty thousand pounds and wow in dollars it's about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars 
Um, so that's that's a lot of money. Crazy money. <laughs> Just some background on John Hume. He is a former property developer who uh, had a very successful career and retired and decided to become a rhino conservationist in his retirement. So he is spending his own money um, and now, except you know, money he can raise because money is a finite resource um, and he's been doing this for a long time. A lot of private rhino owners work off money they make through tourism, um, through trophy hunting, um, through donations as well that's been quite a that's been quite an in-depth introduction to you know the rhino rhino poaching crisis and what a legalized trade in rhino in rhino horn would be so i think now we're going to go for a bit of arguments in favor and then we're going to go for a bit of arguments against and then we're going to come to a kind of discussion where we really (laughs) unpack the nitty-gritty at the end so arguments in favor the first one that springs to mind again, as we were just talking about, is money. It's financial, right? Yeah. Um, I think this is the argument that you hear the most, um, is that there are massive financial benefits to legally trading in rhino horn. So the current trade, international trade in rhino horn, because it's really important to remember that an illegal, it is illegal, but it is happening. Um, and currently, it is completely monopolised by criminals and illegal wildlife traffickers. And they are dealing solely in wild populations of rhino as well so a legal trade would allow conservationists to kind of have a piece of the pie basically so if you've listened to our trophy hunting episode um it's quite a similar argument in terms of funding so if private owners were able to sell their own rhino horn stocks in order to raise money they could use that money to fund their conservation efforts Rhino horn trade is illegal internationally, but as I said, it is happening every day. And the only people making any money from it at the moment are wildlife crime syndicates and wildlife traffickers. Meanwhile, conservationists are paying for the rhino horn trade in terms of protection and care. So an illegal trade would allow for this mismatch to be addressed. Rhinos, as Emma's just mentioned with John Hume's cost, they're incredibly expensive animals to keep due to the costs associated with their protection. They essentially do need 24-7 protection from poaching, which is both expensive and dangerous. Rhino poachers have been known to engage in shootouts with rangers, and both rangers and poachers have been killed by wildlife. Patrols also cost money, fences cost money, and all of this is on top of the already high running costs of a reserve. So even if you didn't have to invest in all this high-tech anti-poaching... It's expensive to run a wildlife reserve. Obviously, it's a lot of land. Land costs money. And all this money has to come from somewhere. So as we kind of mentioned in the trophy hunting episode, while profitable, photo tourism isn't always enough to raise the kind of money needed. Mm. And for rhino owners to be able to share in the profits of the rhino horn trade, there is a potential to raise a lot of money. I think maybe just uh, just to chip in there a point. Um, Mm. So in this podcast I listened to, it was talking to lots of different private um, rhino owners and actually almost all of them were in favour of legalising the trade. And John Hume, I know, has asked permission from the South African government to issue kind of a legalise a domestic um, legalisation of the trade so that he can sell his horns because he's like, how else am I going to fund this? Like, mm-hmm. if it's costing that much a month, he's like, well, I don't agree that it should be have to happen, but in yeah. order to fund it, you almost need the money from selling the horns. Yeah, there's a there's an association of private rhino horn owners and they are, not every single one of them, but yeah, as you say, an incredibly high majority is are in favour of legal trade and uh, one of them at least, somebody I know, I possibly more actually spoke at CITES about this. Um, obviously they oh, wow. were outvoted. Um, but that's it's important because they are really key stakeholders in this debate mm. and so it is... Mainly because they've got the most rhinos Yeah, left. exactly. And they're the ones <laughs> fighting the, the fight every day. They're the ones putting their lives on the line and paying for this illegal trade at the moment another really key argument in favor in terms of financial reasons to legalize the rhino horn trade is that it would raise government funding through taxation Mm, currently you know the government aren't you know seeing any of this money there's no taxes on it there's no it's illegal to import and export and it's illegal to sell and so you're not getting any of that revenue that you could be generating which could go back into the communities back into education into healthcare. it's and you know we all know that taxation is a crazy opportunity to raise money and especially on kind of luxury items which rhino horn is 
Something we've mentioned in previous podcasts um, is the need for the modern world to give financial incentives for conservation work. Whether we agree with it or not, as much as we would love the intrinsic value of nature to be enough, in a world run by money with limited available resources, a legal rhino horn trade gives rhinos a financial value. And crucially, it makes them worth more financially alive than dead. At the moment, a dead rhino is worth more than a live rhino in terms of economics. And that is so sad. And that's that's going to be what dooms the species. But if you can flip that, if you can make a living rhino worth more than a dead one. So there was an economist who did something um, very similar with r- whales really recently. So he basically gave each individual humpback whale a global value over its lifetime of $2 million. And he did that by calculating the current price of carbon, then calculating how much carbon in a whale's lifetime it will sequester from the ocean surface down into the deep ocean. And this gave a value of the whale over its lifetime, a worth of two million wow, per whale. That's incredible um, study. It is incredible. And it's suddenly you think, oh, wow, that's how expensive it is. And yeah. you think, wow, I don't want to foot the bill for that is what uh, I can't afford two million bucks. Yeah. So I don't know anyone can. That, um, that's amazing. And so if you can do the same for rhinos, if you can give each rhino a net value over its lifetime and say, look, you can shoot that rhino and you can sell its horn for three million pounds but if the rhino's worth over its lifetime is 10 million pounds that's not you're 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 losing money there that's Um, yeah that's really cool i I think it just is so interesting way to think it's really really interesting but also i think highlights how backwards it is that we need to place a monetary value on a species for people to be like oh okay now because it's worth two million i'm not going to kill it it's like yeah we shouldn't have anyway but that's just the way our yeah. world works and that's <laughs> exactly. a juicy bit of capitalism right there yep. yeah exactly <laughs> it's it's really sad but unfortunately it, it kind of is the way it, it goes the other kind of big thing you hear about when talking about legalizing a rhino horn trade is the now legal stocks of rhino horn sort of flooding the market leading the kind of black market or illegal price to drop yeah, so if the black market price of rhino horn was dropped, and given how dangerous poaching is, why would you bother? Is kind of the big argument that people come back to a lot. So those are kind of as a pretty brief rundown of the kind of financial benefits of a um, rhino horn trade. But Roby, do you want to kind of go through some of the kind of conservation benefits to rhino if we had a legal international trade? Yeah, so... We talked about, this is going to sound very similar to our trophy hunting podcast, where we talked about the potential conservation benefits of trophy hunting. Um, if you recall the, the conclusion of that episode, I was, uh, I was not entirely convinced by that argument. This time, I am finding it more um, palatable and certainly more convincing. So it'd be really interesting to see what you guys as the viewers think. So, you can harvest horn from a live rhino without killing it. And you can do it every year for the rhino's entire life. So you have got this constant supply, as we've said. Dead rhinos gives you one horn. Live rhinos gives you 50 horns. So killing rhinos for their horn is a financial waste. And we know that illegal horn could have strong protective effects on rhinos, as we've kind of just stated already. But it could also have quite strong protective effects on other species, if you think back to that trophy hunting uh, analogy um especially when and this is the key thing for me the supply for that legal trade is given to conservationists and the people who live with live with the rhinos so so we're gonna do some scenarios here scenario one and i quite like this scenario so a national park has 35 rhinos like most african parks it's got really high running costs due to anti-poaching patrols and also is threatened by land encroachment by local peoples both for agriculture and livestock grazing And so a legal trade in rhino horn could hypothetically place the responsibility for these 35 rhinos with the National Park Service. Every two years, the park rangers cut off the rhino horns and sell them legally. The rhinos survive, they're fine. This provides the park with a massive supplementary source of income, which can then be used to protect the rhinos and by extent all the other species in the park, managing fences, more anti-poaching patrols, helping de-snare the area so you know lions benefit elephants benefit antelope benefit and so therefore a legal rhino trade could potentially benefit both rhinos and other species 
So that's kind of an interesting first scenario. Do you think there would be enough money generated? Do you think the, the market's high enough price-wise for that to be possible? Do you know, I'm not sure because I'm not particularly well-versed in the current market worth of, 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 of how the market worth would change from illegal to uh, legal of Rhino Horn. The second scenario, which I kind of like a bit more, actually, is that, okay, National Park A has 35 rhinos. Again, it's faced massive running costs, encroachment for land and game. In this scenario, a legal trade in rhino horn could hypothetically place the responsibility for managing these rhinos with the local communities surrounding the park. So every two years, the local people come in, they cut off the rhino horns and sell them legally. This provides the local communities with a massive supplementary source of income. This can be used for education, improve, improved access to healthcare, agricultural resources. And it also, which is what I really like about this idea, it allows people historically disenfranchised from the national community to re-engage with the economy. And it would also provide, perhaps most importantly, the local people with an economic incentive not to encroach on the land of the National Park, as well as an economic incentive not to poach or aid others in the poaching of rhinos. And so it would effect create a, a sympathetic buffer zone around the National Park of people dedicated to, because they have an economic incentive, dedicated to rhino conservation. Um, the perfect scenario would be is if the rhino has enough parks, 100, You'd split the management. You'd say, okay, 50% can be harvested by the park, 50% by the people. So that is kind of the conservation argument, to my mind, for legalising the trade in rhino horn. I really like that scenario. And I think that it raises quite a nice point that if this international trade, and we're going to talk about this a bit later, but this would be a completely new thing. And it's like, oh, oh we're, we're trying something not entirely new, obviously it's happened in the past, but we are really changing the game here. It's a massive shake-up of kind of rhino conservation as we are currently doing it, which presents an opportunity to design it how we want. And it's a really nice space to move into community-based management. And I think that would be crucial for it to work. Um, so I think that scenario too, and obviously kind of the third scenario with mm. even more parks than 50-50 with the kind of dream scenario. If, if you've got the rhinos. Yeah, you know. <laughs> that, I think that is what we should be aiming for. Um, and I think it, it this whole debate presents a really nice opportunity to kind of push community-based management, which is currently, you know, on a kind of up and coming thing within conservation that we're trying to move away from kind of fortress colonialism towards community-based management and indigenous knowledge which is great definitely the right way to go and i think this is for all the reasons you just outlined involving the local communities aids conservation aids the people aids the rhinos it's yeah i think it's brilliant i think it's a really I mean, nice you know, scenario it if it worked it could make people wealthier and if they're wealthier, there's less incentive to poach rhinos. And, mm -hmm. it, and you, you know, it's horrible to think of it in monetary terms because obviously it shouldn't be. It should be, oh my God, it's a rhino. It's got a right to life like everything else on the planet. Cool, let's save it. But in the kind of, you know, hyper-consumerist capitalist society in which the global economy works, by actually, you know, allowing these people who live alongside the rhinos to have a say in that global economy... I think that could be really powerful. And, and you... there is... Sorry. No, go on. And on the kind of flip side of consumerist capitalism, if you live in poverty, why should you care about the life of a yeah. rhino? And I, yeah. as someone who I wouldn't, loves know. rhinos, I, <laughs> why should you care? I completely agree with that. And mm. so money is important. And giving local people who... You know, I'm not saying you know all local people live in poverty, but if there are deprived areas in the areas surrounding National Park, as they often are you are giving economic prosperity and options to those people that happen to benefit conservation. And that's the kind of side note. And it again comes back to, as we've said in probably every episode we've recorded, that these kind of move of conservation with social justice has to come together. And you, know, you cannot achieve conservation goals without first alleviating poverty and, and vice versa. And so this kind of partnership this kind of opportunity of this big change of maybe you know legalizing the rhino horn trade as this big shake up gives this opportunity to work then to also alleviate poverty which is 
obviously the aim. <laughs> and and you know, let's not forget that. And I'm going to generalise here, but the majority, the reason why the majority of people surrounding the national park might be um, economically disadvantaged is because when the national park was founded, quite often during the colonial occupation of Africa by, you know, colonial administrators, they were actually kicked out of the land of the national park and pushed into less less suitable land on the outside. It happened in Kruger National Park, the reason why there's a belt of, you know, largely poor people around national around Kruger is because they were I can't remember what they're called something being with M is their is their ethno linguistic group they were a clan who lived there and when um you know Kruger was founded they got kicked out hmm. and now they live on the outskirts and they don't have the fertile land for their grazing so to my mind there is quite a strong moral argument hmm. to saying actually here you go this is your land and you can reap the benefits but also of it. I can see um, there like why there would be that conflict as well with the local people maybe not wanting to engage with the work for the national mm. park if there's that history of being kind of forced off the land and why would they get involved if that's the reason that they lost kind of their homes and they're still in in poverty mm. so i think you, mm. d- you, you do need to work with the local communities and not just be like right we're doing implementing all this external conservation work all these people from abroad are going to come in and do it mm. it's like well if you could actually get the local people doing it instead um, it would give them jobs, say as rangers, things like that, which I think is super important. I just wonder... and it's really it's it's quite unpleasant when you you know you learn about actually the his- the early history of quite a few of these incredible world heritage national parks. So places like Ngorogoro Crater, the Maasai were kicked out, and they're still being kicked out. Um, Maasai Mara and Serengeti, the Maasai are still being kicked out, and it's forced clearances. And you know it's very. It happened in in Scotland as well with local people getting forced off of the land and. If you can reframe that relationship and say, actually, we're, you know, we can't change it, but we can give you the power now to have your own agency again, that could really turn a page in relations between conservationists and local, I say local, but, you know, people on the ground. And we need them. Like, we cannot do this without them. Mm. Um, You know, indigenous knowledge is unrivaled. You could read every science book ever written. It's not... It is unrivaled. You're not going to compete with someone who's lived and worked on this land for their whole life. We need them more than they need us, for sure. Um, but yes, to kind of undo the horrors that were done previously and mm. reapproach the relationship and work in collaboration is really important. I just want to say quickly before we move off this kind of community based management discussion that we've spoken about it here in the context of national parks in terms of rhino farming as we kind of spoke about in the beginning or f- farming in inverted commas ranching whatever you want to call it rhino there ranching, is um that sounds fun <laughs> yeah there's also here here a massive opportunity for community-based managements to have private owner landowners also working with communities to protect their rhino and this is something john hume has spoken about in terms of giving ownership of a certain crash of rhinos to a certain group of people for example and that's theirs yeah, to that's look after mm. um so it's definitely a possibility w- with kind of both approaches of wild harvesting and mm. ranching so yeah i think maybe just to bring it back a little bit the community aspect is so so important and i think it's really good we did speak about that um might be useful for people to have a case study of where legalization of a trade of an animal has actually been successful um, so this was a case with crocodiles. Um, so crocodiles were kind of poached extensively for their skins for the fashion industry, um, huge population crashes. And crocodile farming was kind of what emerged as a, a way to preserve wild populations um, and just conserve crocodiles in general. Um, so all species of crocodile are crocodilian are listed on the CITES appendices. So it means that the trade is kind of internationally regulated on these species. So therefore anyone using wild crocodile resources has to demonstrate that these that particular product or skin or whatever it is does not actually threaten the survival of the species. So it's monitoring wild populations, but also the farming's really regulated. And actually, interestingly, there's a way to identify these legal skins. So they have these unique numbers with these non-reusable tags um and so this is elimination of this hunting pressure from wild populations as a result of these farms has basically enabled crocodiles to 
sort of recover. So it's kind of this is a bit of a success story in the ter- in sen- in the sense that the legal trade is being regulated and it's actually beneficial to um, wild populations. But I guess big difference there is crocodiles. Um, you have to kill them for the skin um, and maybe easier to tag them and monitor them rather than rhino horn. Um, because I, in my mind, I'm still not clear how you would differentiate legal horn from illegal horn. Like, yeah. I don't know yeah. how I you think, would do that. I think a similar it, system would have to be invented as they obviously mm. invented for the the crocodiles. But I think the fact that you have to kill crocodiles, again, that it's rhino horn poten- has more potential to be a sustainable farm than a crocodile farm because you can continuously harvest rhino horn, whereas you can't continuously harvest a crocodile skin. Yeah. So I think if it's been successful there, that is a a case study kind of that we could base this of and like you say i think it's could be even more successful if it's not actually having to kill the rhino at all so there is some evidence there that it, it, it could work it's interesting to actually have a proper case study where farming has actually contributed to conservation and is now funding conservation as well um so those are kind of those are the arguments for rhino uh horn legal rhino horn trade i'm kind of you know it's kind of got me thinking a bit more about my own position about it i'm kind of i'm ruminating i'm I'm mulling it (laughs) over hi everyone it's kate here and i'm really excited to tell you that this episode of the biome podcast is sponsored by animal tea animal tea is a uk speciality tea company that donates 100 percent of its profits to fund wildlife conservation Their range of eight loose leaf teas include everyday favourites like their organic white tea to rare treasures like the Satinoir Spearmint. I'm drinking the Earl Grey and it's my new favourite tea to have every morning. Listeners to the podcast can get 15% off their first order by going to animaltea.com, spelt A-N-I-M-A-L-L-T-E-A.com and using the code BIOME at checkout. Orders arrive in a compostable pouch plus a piece of original wildlife art with every order. Every tea they sell helps fund global conservation projects, from primates to pangolins, leopards to lions. So if you want 15% off your first order, check out animaltea.com, A-N-I-M-A-L-L-T-E-A.com and use the code BIOME, B-I-O-M-E, all in capitals, at checkout. And now, back to the podcast. Um. So shall we go to opposition now? Because you yeah. know we've got to have a. We can't. Re- you can't really make a balanced opinion without hearing a balanced debate. So, mm-hmm. what's what? What are we thinking with opposition arguments against here? I mean, I think a big one to mention is obviously the ethical side of it. Yeah. So Chinese medicine is something that dates back thousands of years, um, ingrained kind of cultural and traditional practice, and it is not going to change. Um, so. The idea that given the current state of the rhino populations, which, as we've outlined, is small, um, even if the majority of people stopped buying rhino horn, the rhino would still go extinct supplying the minority because this, the demand for it, its use in Chinese medicine is not going to go away. Um, and also, I think it's hard. It's like, where does it come in that we, we tell people that their, their medicine practices are wrong? Um, so you've got this whole case of a placebo effect. If you think something's working, um, there have actually been some cases where people feel like they're getting better and, and like, how can you take that away from someone if they feel like they're going to massively improve because of rhino horn? But I don't know. It's just because Western societies don't support it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, but I think there's a really ethical, blurred ethical line here without kind of insulting another culture but then you also have to make the point that there's no scientific evidence to support this trade and educating people about it is probably the best thing that we can do but i think it's really really hard to just go in and say no it has no medicinal benefit you're wrong and this is not going to cure your child of cancer so don't bother um, and I think I think this argument is something that a lot of people use, okay, not a lot of people, that people can use to disengage themselves from this debate. So I read something very recently, and I'll, I'll, the links to all of our research will be in, in the comments below, um, which actually unpacks a bit of the nuance around this issue and makes the distinction between traditional Chinese medicine as a whole and specifically the use of rhino horn in traditional Chinese medicine. So obviously, traditional Chinese medicine goes back thousands of years, as does 
the traditional medicines of everywhere, every culture ever has always had its traditional medicinal values. You know, we boiled nettles to cure deafness and things like that. Um, but the use of rhino horn in particular is a relatively recently arising belief. And it's been documented as only going back a couple hundred years. Notably, there is not a single authentic historical traditional Chinese medicine text that has ever mentioned the use of rhino horn as an aphrodisiac or a cure for cancer. And it seems to be that this belief kind of originated once trade links and industrialised contact between China and European colonial powers began. And it then greatly increased in the 18th to 19th centuries. And so this use has actually been quite tentatively, and I'm not sure that it's been peer reviewed, but it's been tentatively linked to an increase in European export of ivory and rhino horn out of Africa when the European powers essentially pitched up and nicked an entire continent. So the argument that rhino horn has medicinal purposes being a long held belief is not actually quite as or is not thought to hold quite so much water as as it as it might be thought i straight this is quite a new idea and this is quite a new publication that i read this in so i suspect as time progresses either evidence will be found for this view that i've just put forward or it won't be mm. but i think it is worth noting when we talk about this that rhino horn the use of rhino horn in traditional medicine may not be as enshrined in the practices practices of, of traditional South Asian medicines as you might think it might be. That's really interesting because that sort of fills you with a little bit of hope that mm. education could be enough, um, which kind of is a you know, big argument against this legal trade of we shouldn't be supplying a trade, we should be ending the trade. Um, and that the idea that it's... That, the use of rhino horn is a long belief has always kind of refuted the has always kind of made it seem like no education won't work because we can't we can't mm. undo the damage is too far it's too far it goes too far back but maybe it could which kind of suggests education could work but this also when you were talking just then what i was kept thinking is if it's if it's this new thing that's come about because of access it just kind of come back to what we said at the beginning about putting it in paracetamol, that it just feels like a scam and people mm. are being scammed. And it's it's really interesting that when you say scam, um, just to kind of bounce off of that, this same publication made the link that um, the, the, use of, the, the use of rhino horn in traditional Chinese medicine seems to be more prevalent in Western media at any one time than in Chinese media. And it made the link that perhaps when this issue first became brought up there was an element of kind of western orient western orientalism fetishization about the debate in that you know 50 years ago when we were you know much more entrenched in our kind of colonial outset we might have thought we might have found it a lot more easy to believe that rhino hornism is is long held in in the far eastern cultures because we might have had that slightly biased viewpoint that oh they're very strange they're very different you know sure they use rhino horn and how barbaric is that so it's interesting actually how much our own cultural um preconceptions might be affecting our dialogue of this debate yeah that is really interesting and like a lot to think about for sure yeah i know, um, I, know. I read it and i was like oh god yeah i think the the kind of whole idea of this leads on quite well to another kind of ethical issue that kind of goes against could be used as against legalizing the trade is when you're considering selling a product that you know based on western medicine we have no proof that it has medicinal value should we should we be selling it should we legalize it because a lot yeah you know it's this real ethical <laughs> dilemma of you know to put it bluntly should we sell a product that we don't think works <laughs> and so you know, a significant portion of the people buying rhino horn, as we kind of understand it, are desperate and they buy it in an attempt to cure a loved one's illness. And if it's not this long held belief, they are being told mm. that that's what it does. And so they are kind of used it to like, well, so there's this kind of moral issue in allowing people to buy products that 
we don't know if they work if they're buying it in these desperate situations if that makes sense i think that's something that i really you know really struggle with and i think it's quite i guess i guess i guess the way you do that is you do something with cigarettes yeah so so you know how you can only sell cigarettes if there's the banner saying but it kills can i make a point first about kind of maybe yeah i don't know say we go into a pharmacy this was someone else's point that they made it really made me think and there's all these products which are like anti-aging products this makes you look beautiful this makes you look like they're load of rubbish um and <laughs> you were so close to saying bollocks <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i could see it on the tip oh, of your tongue i was like oh am i allowed to say that i don't know um i think you are but that yeah. idea that we are being sold all these products every day yes mm. it's not rhino horn but it's a lie it's not yeah. something that it's buying a product from a pharmacy is not going to suddenly make you younger is it it's yeah it, that definitely. is a scam in itself yeah i think this is this is true like we are being scammed constantly we are always buying products that we don't know if they work that doesn't justify putting another one on the market though but i do agree i think the kind of response to this if we were to legalize the rhino horn trade is that you just sell it for what it is you just say you can buy rhino horn here you don't say what you what do you use it for you don't give recommendations on what to use it for you do not market it as a medicine you don't even necessarily have to sell it in a pharmacy. You could just sell it. And yeah, like you say, Roby, kind it's of up, it's similar... It's up to people to use it for whatever they want. Similar to the cigarettes kill campaign. Yeah. You have to label that cigarettes are dangerous. You could make it a mandatory requirement that you have to say there is no like peer-reviewed scientific evidence that this is a medicine. But you can buy rhino horn here. Or even just not even mention the word medicine. Just say, buy rhino horn. It's a rhino horn. What is it? What does it do? It's a rhino horn. Does nothing. It just you can, <laughs> it, you, you, it does whatever you make yeah, it do. You, it's a rhino horn. And what yeah. people decide to buy it and do with it is their prerogative. Yeah. But there is a yeah. It's this kind of ethical dilemma of should we even do that? So who would have thought there were so many different ethical angles to bleeding rhino horn? <laughs> I mean, because then you've got you don't the... get this with mongooses. <laughs> no you don't and um, Pit vipers but i guess there's there's also the other ethical side as well moving away from people is is the wildlife ethics isn't there so yeah rhinos themselves in terms of keeping them in captivity to farm them would raise some ethical questions because they're not domesticated the the ethical questions to my mind decrease the more domesticated an animal is. For instance, the ethical considerations when keeping a herd of cows would be very different to keeping a herd of bison. Um, So rhinos, we know, all species are territorial. Black rhinos, certainly more so, or more violently so. Would you agree, Kate? Yeah, they're quite aggressive. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And obviously, it's a two-ton mega herbivore. It needs a massive amount of land. It needs a massive amount of resources. Um... You know, you couldn't keep them in in the same conditions you keep cattle in. You have to keep them a a bit like John Hume on this massive ranch, which takes days to traverse. Um, And there are kind of fears that because the scale of the legal market would therefore have to be limited in scale because of the costs associated with keeping all these rhinos healthily, as you'd have to do, that the trade the legal trade would not actually be able to keep up with the demand from asia because if you think about it rhino horn you know how fast do your fingernails and your hair grow rhino horn only grows by about six centimeters per year for a young individual when it's growing it for the first time and that rate actually decreases as the animal ages um so you know the 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 counter argument could be well you can legalize the trade but will it actually ever meet or even sate the demand yeah, I think that is a good point. But the kind of flip side is that poaching will run the species to extinction. So <laughs> poaching's never going to meet the demand. Yeah, that's true. But then that's on true. the kind of flip side of that is <laughs> if you can't meet the demand either way, surely we should just be trying to stop the demand rather than trying to supply it. And the counter, counter, counterpoint yeah. <laughs> would be that if all but the largest and best funded farms would struggle to provide adequate ethical care to the large numbers of rhinos needed to meet the demand, why don't we just subcontract it out to the national parks and the local communities where the rhinos can live in an entirely natural setting in vast areas and every couple of years chop the horn off and, you know, with a network of kind of loyal, incentivised people around them um, looking out for them. The foundations of the arguments for 
the legal rhino horn trade kind of rest on the fact that you can sustainably harvest rhino horn with no impact to the rhinos. But as I understand it, we're not like, shall we unpack that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it comes without risk entirely. Like we've talked about this before with wildlife when you've got um, just even the aspect of moving them around or kind of translocation or keeping them, there are are risks Mm. there. But when you're actually trimming the horn, um, obviously you can't do this when the rhino is um, awake um, because you would risk your own life of being <laughs> impaled by the horn. Um, so you, you have to give them an, an anaesthetic. And with an animal that large and a wild animal, this, this also comes with risk. So they need to make sure they're cool enough. There's been cases where um, you kind of have to throw buckets of water on them or with wild animals like dunk. This is with... Um, painted walls but like dunking them in <laughs> buckets of cold water because their temperatures just skyrocket under oh, an- wow. anesthetic and it can be really really dangerous um and also just a point to make that rhinos do use their they have their horns for a purpose that's that's why they're there um so they use them to protect themselves they also use them kind of for foraging barging their way through big um scrubby landscapes um, and they can survive without them. Um, there haven't been any kind of adverse effects that have been documented on horn trim populations, but they did evolve the horn for a reason. So some people argue that you shouldn't be re- removing them from wild horn. Shouldn't be removing horns from wild rhinos. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's def- I think the impacts on rhinos are obviously, you know, inc- definitely worth considering, especially the anaesthetic. The kind of counterpoint I would say is that many particularly private rhino owners, but also some regional parks now, they're already horn trimming their rhinos under anaesthetic in order to protect them from poaching, even though they currently cannot sell the horns. So they're just vaulting the horns and keeping them locked up. So it's kind of whether or not we legalise the the trade, horn trimming is becoming common practice and rhinos are living without their horns. So as much as it is a problem, it's going to happen anyway. Yeah, and it's, it's. I've been worrying. I've been kind of want, worrying. I've been. I have been worrying. I have been wondering about this quite a lot. So I did quite a bit of research on this. And so whether or not rhinos actually need their horns is still debated because we haven't found the clear evolutionary purpose of them. Um, we know they have a physical function, as as you said, Emma. You know, bashing through bushes and rooting around and stabbing lions. Um, but it seems the current thinking is that the function of the horn may involve sexual selection more than any physical function and that the physical function is just kind of a a side effect. In in a similar way with elephants, the tusks are a sexual characteristic, a secondary sexual characteristic, and all the myriad uses that the elephants have for them are kind of secondary onto that. Um, And it's thought that, you know, it's a kind of a territorial and dominance function. So a bit like when you see the elk... When they do all the red deer, when they're doing the rutting, the two males they compare horns. Okay, big horn dominates little horn, so little one gets out of there. Um, and so you know there is a risk there that dehorning might undermine the ability of like a big a, a big male to retain territory and status. Um, although the number one natural death, the number one cause of natural death among rhinos, both males and females, is fights with other rhinos. Mm. So dehorning in Zimbabwe was shown to reduce fighting-relating mortalities. So you've got that weird trade-off. Maybe the rhinos, um, you know, reproductive paradigm shifts, and maybe that's a bad thing. But also, if more rhinos are living anyway because the rhinos aren't stabbing each other mm. all the time maybe they balance out. So it's a really interesting... Yeah. I don't think we've got enough information it's sort of, at the moment to make a it's sort point of about that. It kind of hurts my brain almost because it's this weird thing where the, the natural... Pro- <laughs> we're interrupting the natural process, but the natural process that we're interrupting is bad for rhino conservation, kind of mortality through fights. Yeah. So, I think it's hard, it's hard to get your head around. <laughs> I, am I happy about this? Like, I don't know. <laughs> because it's good that less rhinos are dying, but... <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> It's confusing, and I think that it. Whenever we interrupt a natural process, it's kind of like oh, but then oh, sometimes it it could be a good thing, I guess, in terms of the overall that, that, aim my reaction of too. conservation. Ugh. Yeah, to so like even mess with your head even more if we're when we're intervening in natural processes. Um, we talked about this in the trophy hunting episode about kind of could poaching. Um, or kind of the artificial selection pressures that we're putting on these animals 
be causing sort of phenotypic changes. So if mm-hmm. so this would mainly refer to the illegal poaching of rhinos, not the horn trimming. But if they're being poached extensively as they are and horns are being hacked off, would it then lead to rhinos being born with shorter horns over time just just naturally? Um, I don't know. What, what do you guys think about that? <laughs> I think po- poaching certainly would because it involves the death of one animal, which would have a selection pressure on the ones that survived for any particular reason that they survived. I think farming might not... Mm. Yeah, I think sure. I think if they didn't die, then it wouldn't. Mm. Um, yeah. But then that, there's that whole idea of the poaching could then be contributing to shorter horns, which is that idea of is that yeah the thing with them fighting? Like if they have shorter horns, are they less likely to die in fights? It's that whole. <laughs> oh, I guess God. it depends oh, how selective poaching is, because I guess the difference with trophy hunting is you're selectively killing larger horns, whereas poaching is a bit more opportunistic. I think as much as they would rather kill. Mm the rhino with the biggest horn and if poaching was continuously targeting the bigger the rhinos with the biggest horns that would eventually then feed back into evolution but obviously they die with their horns and if poaching's more opportunistic so they kill rhino with any size horn as we know they do because they sometimes kill baby rhinos with tiny horns but obviously i think ideally they aim for the biggest horn so i think there's potential for it there Another impact on rhinos I just wanted to touch on quickly in terms of an argument mm. against the legal horn, uh, legal horn, against the legal trade in rhino horn is that if this was announced tomorrow, say we had a CITES convention of parties tomorrow and they said, okay, cool, we're going to legalise horn. It wouldn't be that as of tomorrow, it's illegal. It's legal, sorry. Obviously, these processes take time. We all know that the paperwork, the admin involved in the legal system is just outrageous. And... There are concerns of that time gap where we know a legal trade is coming, but it's not in effect yet, that poaching would massively increase because this is the last mm. time that the black market has a monopoly on trade. And especially mm. the Asian, Asian species and also the black rhino species where we've only got 5,000 or less than 100, would they survive that? Um, that with black rhinos that kind of spike in poaching could put them in a population bottleneck that they might not get out of so that's a kind of another impact that a legal trade could have is that the time it would take to be in effect the elite poaching could spike and with when we're talking about such small populations they might not get through it i mean expect you know the javan and sumatran ones any spike would just that's it Mm -hmm. they're already on the edge yeah. I mean, and also you made that point earlier with the Java ones. They're in one place mm-hmm. and everyone knows they're in that one place. They're there. People know about it. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, I just thought of that. So that's no, that, that's, a, that's a really good <laughs> Not point. Not on the document. <laughs> um, another kind of argument people throw about a lot um, against legal trade is that we should leave wild animals alone. This kind of talks more to the wild harvesting um, process mm-hmm. um, that rhinos have their horns and we shouldn't be removing them. People also argue against horn trimming for protection for those same reasons. Well, it's kind of a moot point for me because if we leave them alone, they'll all die Mm. and there won't be any rhinos, horned or otherwise. Yeah, So yeah, that's true. The the non-interventionist argument doesn't hold any truck with me. I I agree. I think we're we're past that point. Um, I think in an ideal world, of course, we'd let nature be nature and we'd not intervene but we've intervened so much already that we can't now <laughs> it's now is not the time <laughs> to yeah. take a step back but kind of following on from that point another argument against mm. the horn trade um that you hear quite a lot are the impacts on tourism um so a lot of people when they visit africa they want to see the big five or the kind of classic charismatic species of which rhinos is one of them black rhinos are in the big five and a lot of these tourists they do they want to see a rhino with a horn they want to see elephants with big tusks they want to see a male lion with a big mane and it is possible that horn trimmed rhinos would have an adverse impact on tourism because tourism want to pay tourists want to pay to see and photograph these big horns i kind of think that again this isn't the strongest argument and Mm. it's it doesn't kind of as much as i understand it it doesn't really weigh up to some of the arguments the other arguments we've mentioned and i think that seeing a horn trimmed rhino if you're on a game drive is the perfect opportunity to educate tourists about the rhino poaching crisis Mm. the kind of horn trade and just kind of wildlife trafficking and the conservation industry in general um 
the safari holidays are an incredible way if you have a good guide to learn so much about conservation and often people leave safari holidays feeling really inspired um, or any holiday where you're out in nature to kind of help and be more environmentally friendly and help these species so I think actually we could use it as a really educational moment and I think it's almost a bit unfair on tourists to assume that they wouldn't want that Mm. Um, because also I think a big uh, issue with photo tourism currently is that people are documenting wildlife in these perfect conditions um, and they're not showing the true side of what's actually going on so there have been some photographers recently which I've been quite moved by is where you show on a safari that there are actually loads of trucks around that huge line with the big mane it's not just a sole truck in this wilderness and there's no people likewise mm. if you had a picture of rhino without a horn you're like okay that it is not perfect these rhinos aren't there's not uh that what am I trying to say the threat of poaching hasn't been eliminated completely like it's an educational tool which I think is good yeah and I, I agree with you both for some reason I think I can't put my finger on it but for some reason I'm not doesn't ring with me I, the fact that you wouldn't people I think if you genuinely didn't go on safari because you thought you might see a rhino without a horn mm. I, I, I don't I mean yeah it doesn't make we, sense it, it doesn't make sense I, I'm not convinced I think um, people who book holidays that are nature based do so because they have a level of interest in nature um, yeah. You will obviously get the few ignorant people that are like, I just want to do it. It's on my bucket list. Like, I just want to see the rhino. Like, I don't care. Blah, blah, blah. But they are, if they even exist, they are the minority. I think the majority of people go because they want to be immersed and learn about nature and conservation. And so it's a really educational tool. I think another thing to mention, which is going to be quite important. And we, again, we touched on this quite a lot when we talked about trophy hunting and particularly of lions, is that illegal trade however well managed is probably unlikely to actually mean the end of all poaching Mm. um it's i you know yeah i that's true poaching will always exist i think though and this is something that we keep coming back to in this podcast is what is the aim of conservation and that's what are we trying to do with illegal trade and are we trying to save every individual animal's life Or are we trying to allow the species to persist? persist? And ending poaching is obviously the dream, um, but unrealistic scenario. But limiting poaching so that the species have a chance to survive, that's what we are aiming for. So as much as, yeah, illegal trade wouldn't end poaching, it might allow for enough of a decline that the species can recover. I completely agree. Like, to an extent, your own personal definition of conservation will change depending on Um, your particular interests and where you might work in the sector personally for me the aim of conservation must be to allow the species and by extent its ecosystem function and by extent the ecosystem to persist i think it's unrealistic and impractical 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 and actually potentially even harmful and counterproductive to try and save every single individual animal's life however much we might want to um I think a much more impactful goal is is the is the the saving of the species as a whole. Um. Yeah, and I think kind of linking that with just just poaching that it's always going to be there. I think there are kind of some important lessons as well we can draw from um, what happened when we legalized the ivory trade. And for me, I think this is still the biggest argument as to why there are blocks in my head as to why legalization that there are still some some issues there because what happened with ivory was that when they legalized the trade it's kind of been described as the world's most horrendous mistake in terms of elephants because CITES lifted the ban to allow for the stock selling of these um of ivory that people had accumulated and this led to kind of the biggest um spike in elephant poaching that's happened in history so that was in in 2008 and interestingly Kate I think you mentioned before when we're talking about rhinos there was also a big spike in 2008 so I'm also questioning whether it just created this idea that these animal parts were valuable again because I think that's what it does it gives people the message that the value it will with the case of ivory that the value of ivory was on the rise and therefore that the market sometime in the future would then open up so people started stockpiling led to this huge poaching crisis and 
also it's very hard again that coming back to telling the difference between legal and illegal um parts so people were just replacing these legal stocks with illegal ones and no one was able to tell the difference so in my mind that's i i worry that the same thing could happen with with rhinos but i think that's Mm. just that's an important comparison to make that that was a case yes it was a one-off which then turned into another one-off lift Mm. on (laughs) on cites um rules um but that did have catastrophic impacts for elephants yeah i think the the kind of point that a legal trade would be open to abuse is is important and that could include anything from as you say the, the difficulty to tell the legal and illegal horns or tusks apart and also just you know money laundering opportunities <laughs> trafficking um you know there's no such thing as a kind of crime free well mm, you know it, industry yeah exactly um so th- that is something really important to bear in mind when considering legalizing the rhino horn trade so that kind of summarizes the kind of main arguments against that we're going to fit in the podcast obviously there will be other pros and cons um that you guys might know of or think of so definitely comment them down below we obviously cannot we've already spoken for a long time we cannot (laughs) cover everything so we're going to just move on to a few kind of discussion questions that we felt were important that kind of came out through the research before finally concluding with what our all our opinions are so the first kind of question we wanted to discuss is are there any alternatives to a legal trade that are viable and are therefore worth investing in more? So I've kind of, as you know, going through all this research, I kind of came up with three positive, pos- positive? <laughs> three possible alternative um, strategies to rhino conservation, which, which don't uh, include the legalisation of rhino horn. So the first one is horn removal. So again, you know, linking in with what we're talking about. So this kind of strategy is all rhinos, wild or otherwise, have their horns removed. Um, I'm not convinced this is a particularly sustainable solution. The costs of tracking down every wild wild rhino in Africa to chop its horn off every two years is astronomical. (laughs) Some horn would always be left in the face of the rhino, which would still be a temptation Uh, For poachers, you can only remove about 93% of a horn when you chop it off. But poachers are still willing to kill to get to the the remaining 7%. Um, Regrowth of dehorned rhino horn appears to be faster than non-dehorned growth. Hang on. Regrowth of dehorned rhino horn appears to be faster than than non-dehorned growth. So you would... Maybe it wouldn't even be two years. You'd have to keep chopping, keep chopping. Um... You know, and the evidence for this kind of is for and against. You know, Namibia um, was the first country to de- dehorn its rhinos to protect them from poaching. Can, can um, I just between... ask, what are they doing with the horns? Because then if the horns still exist... Stockpiling them. Stockpiling. Stockpiling. So, uh, Burying them in a vault. Yeah, they are locked up with 24-hour protection. Yeah. Which, again, is another cost. Mm. You've got to pay those oh, dudes. That's a huge cost, yeah. Yeah. Um, also, how how willing are you to stand outside of a shed... And risk your life if a poacher turns up with a gun mm. to stop them nicking a load of keratin. You know? Yeah. Um, just chop your fingernails, mate. Yeah, um, lob them at him. So yeah, Namibia, Namibia did this and between 1989 and 1990, dehorning combined with rapid improvements in security and funding for anti-poaching resulted in not a single dehorned rhino being poached. The object word being there, not a single dehorned rhino being poached. Mm. Um... Furthermore, according to Save the Rhino, in Zimbabwe's low-veld conservancies, dehorned rhinos have a 29.1% higher chance of survival than horned animals. Um, and again, uh, I like that they've actually done some numbers on that. I really That puts it into a good image for me. Um, and in... Uh, Mpumalanga. I'm going to try and pronounce it. Mpumalanga yeah. in South Africa. Thank you very much. Um, over a third of all rhinos have been dehorned, and out of 33 rhinos killed between 2009 and 2011, only one was a dehorned rhino. So those both seem quite positive towards dehorning. Mm. But you then go to Huanje National Park in Zimbabwe in the 1990s. The majority of dehorned rhinos were killed just a year after being dehorned. Mm. Um, 
in Zimbabwe's Save Valley Conservancy, six new dehorned rhinos were poached in 2011. One, only 24 hours after being dehorned. So I think what this shows Mm. is that dehorning is only a successful conservation strategy if it is combined with really rigorous anti-poaching security uh, grassroots conservation. I don't... I, I don't think it's worth investing in as a single solution alternative because I think it can only ever work as as a, as a lesser part of other greater strategies. I think um, um, an, another kind of problem with dehorning um, as a kind of single strategy is that unless it's universal, unless all the rhinos are dehorned, it actually makes rhinos that haven't been dehorned or horn trimmed more vulnerable. Um, So this was discussed in, um, I think I've discussed this book before. Um, So Lawrence Anthony wrote The Elephant Whisperer and his wife wrote the sequel, An Elephant in My Kitchen. And she discussed um, the kind of options of keeping her rhino safe. And she didn't want to horn trim. Um, She wasn't comfortable with it. She didn't like the idea of taking the rhino's horns off for kind of just her own reason she just wasn't comfortable with it. She didn't want to intervene in that way. And she kind of waited until the last possible second to do it. But she realised that she was surrounded by reserves that had horn trimmed. And in that moment, she decided to do it because she said, oh my gosh, there's now a rhino, there's a target on my rhino's back because they have the biggest horns in the area. And I think dehorning, if you dehorned all the rhinos, that there'd also be a worry that then it wouldn't matter because they've all been dehorned so that dehorned rhinos would still be poached because we're always going to have poaching. But if you only do horn some or horn trim some and not others, then the ones that haven't been horn trimmed are more of a target. So it's, I think it's it's just not something that can work in isolation. I think it's incredibly valuable um, tool for conservationists. And if I was a private rhino or hon- if I was a private rhino owner or a rhino owner of any kind, I would horn trim my rhinos for their own protection. But yeah, it it can't be a standalone. I agree with you. It definitely needs to be with intense protection and do you even in places where you know there is funding as well so kruger national park one of the largest national parks in in south africa also one of the largest national parks on the continent um you know very well as well funded as a national park can be with massive tourist income and all that stuff a single dehorning costs around 620 dollars you've got to do that for every single rhino every year um and it's so they calculated a one-off dehorning which wouldn't solve the problem, but a one-off dehorning would cost between five and eight million dollars. Dollars. And some will always escape. There's always going to be a rhino hiding in that thicket or behind mm. that hedge, which you don't see. Um, and that's just going to lure, po- lure poachers back in. Um, I really like that point you made, that if you dehorn some but not others, mm. it puts a target on those others back. Which is a problem um, at the moment because a lot of private owners are doing it because they're focusing on their population, keeping their rhinos and their rangers safe. But national parks, a lot of national parks haven't done it yet because of the reason they give is the tourism reason. Um, I don't know if that's actually why it probably is more to do with costs. But um, I think that also makes national parks more vulnerable. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an it's an interesting alternative. Um, I still not sure what you do with the horns. Like it's a bit of a a issue there. Mm. But another interesting one that... um, we researched doing this is kind of horn coloring or horn poisoning um so this is an idea developed to make the horn unattractive on the Mm. market because obviously it's not the horn in its natural state and it's also not good for the end user if it's poisoned um so this was a technique developed in 2011 by the rhino rescue project and basically what it does it, it infuses the horns of living rhinos Um, in the case of colouring with a pink dye um, and a they it's interesting they often use kind of ectoparasitics when they're using toxins so they can use um, like anti-tick poisons and things like that they often use those Um, so this combination of a pink dye and tick poison is safe for rhinos and other animals but it's toxic to humans probably good to mention it's not intended to be lethal but it will have some nasty um, side effects Um, and so this process also um, involves inserting these identification chips and also taking DNA samples I guess that's a way that you can monitor Mm. the the individual horns Um, 
And so Rhinohorn, like we kind of described, maybe a bit weird to picture, but like that pressurized hair or kind of just picture it like like that. Um, that Rhinohorn is really fibrous. And so this dye um, infuses actually within the whole horn. So it goes inside as well. Um, but it doesn't actually color the surface or have any impact on rhino behavior or survival. Um, so like we said, might be some effects on the end user. So when they consume this horn that's been like poisoned, basically, um, could cause some effects like nausea, stomach aches, diarrhea, convulsions, but it wouldn't kill you. It would just be very unpleasant. Uh, what I quite like about this idea is that it's not you know, right, uh, poachers come in, start cutting the horn off the rhino, see that it's pink and run off, because they've already shot the rhino by this point. The point is, if you've got these signs around all the refuge saying, all of these rhinos in this park have pink horns and, f- and have nauseating effects, there's no value. So the poachers come in, they see that, and they think, okay, well, I'm not going to poach these rhinos because I'm not going to get any money for mm. it. The, de- the dealer, sorry... Yeah, the dealer won't pay me for delivering pink horn because it's pink when it's ground up into a powder. They won't pay me for delivering horn, which is, you know, having nauseating effects. So it's it's not like they get halfway and think, oh, God, it's a pink horn and run off. It's they never even get there because they know very clearly that in this park, none of the rhinos will be economically viable. And I think importantly, like you say, with the signposting and telling people about it, um, it's also that aspect of maybe doing it in the presence of the local community and the staff as well because they've said that 90% of poaching incidents are possible because of inside knowledge. Hmm. And so there was a a private um, rhino owner who did this and she was putting dyes and toxins into her horns and in front of the entire community. So then that spreads the word that those horns are off off limits, basically. Hmm. I think that's Um, really clever from her. But my issue with this is that it's, it's the same as with the horn trimming. I think this would only work if every single rhino in Africa was had their horn dyed mm. pink because, again, it just makes non-poisoned horns more vulnerable. Mm. And also there's the ethical concern of, okay, uh, you're buying rhino horn powder for your sick relative who's mm. quite, you know, got yeah. cancer and then they ingest this thing and they have convulsions. Well, that's not going to help their health and, you know... As, as, as much as we want to conserve rhinos, we shouldn't be killing people who are using the product. Um, mm. And also there's quite a few other, you know, does it, will, will the infusion work as intested? It would have to be, you know, it would have to be reapplied this treatment because as the horn grows, it gets worn down and grows again. So you'd have to reply it every four years. Mm. Um, so I, I don't know, what do you guys think? I personally like this idea and would like to see a bit more investment, but I don't think it should be a blanket solution. I'm not optimistic about it because I think it, it, well, as I said, it would have to be kind of universal. I also think that I don't think poachers care. Um, and well, when I say poachers, I don't think the people paying the poachers to do the poaching care because generally speaking, poachers are not the actual people on the ground doing the round of poaching. They're not the problem. A lot of them are blackmailed, forced into doing the poaching. It's the the big kind of wildlife crime syndicates that are the kind of enemy here and I don't think they care like I think they would sell a pink horn and if the user on the other end the person buying it says why is it pink he just says oh this one's just pink or like oh we just dyed it to that he could you know say any he or she could say anything yeah, you know we just dyed true. it to to get it through customs um and I I guess it might work if it's the buyer yeah who buys directly from the poacher yeah but if if it's going to a drugstore mm. they'll just say oh yeah cool bye yeah. And they don't care about the, the consumer. Yeah, because they don't care about the consumer. That's that's really key. Mm. They care about making money and they will just sell it anyway. And because we mm. don't have, because the trade is illegal, we don't have any control over the marketing of the product and mm. all the campaigns. So they could be saying anything. They could say, oh, it's pink. It's even stronger. It's, you know, we put something in it to make it even better. So I just, I don't know if it would work. But I think uh, an issue with this as well is it doesn't fit into the legal trade framework because if it was a legal trade it would be sort of a direct trade between um african rhinos and then possibly the chinese medicine hospitals and so if you had a toxin infused horn that would never be regulated on the legal market so it's so open Mm -hmm. to exploitation by the illegal market because the the end consumer are not going to buy something that is causing all these convulsions um 
but then it's like maybe that would tackle demand i don't know maybe that would drive it down if people didn't buy it we really need to get a market economist into this podcast. <laughs> yeah, <don't> we do. <laughs> I think it's a useful solution for an individual rhino owner, but I don't think it's a mm. universal rhino conservation solution, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree with you on that. And so the third alternative to a legal trade that we kind of came up upon um, is artificial substitutes for rhino horn. So in the same way you can now, you know, lab grow beef or meat or whatever, you can grow in a lab artificial rhino horn you can grow it either using actual genetic material or synthetic material um and so you know the 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 genetic code of the bioengineered corn can be registered and compared with living rhino dna so you can have some regulation of that trade um initially a lot of conservationists including save the rhino were dismissive um a 2016 report from traffic which is an organization which monitors trade and legal rhino reports said you know we shouldn't rule out the possibility that trade, and this is how they worded it, that trade in synthetic rhinoceros horn could play a role in future conservation strategies. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, it's a nice idea. I'm not convinced. There was a nice internal position paper from the Zoological Society of London in 2016, which said that in order for this to go ahead, there would have to be three tests, three criteria which had to be satisfied before you would approve that. And that would be, one that you can perfectly substitute it, uh, one that you can strongly govern and regulate it, and also consumer preference. Would people, would people or the market, you know, still buy synthetic horn? And they then concluded, just looking at rhinos, that it, it the this synthetic horn meets none of those conditions. Mm. So I'm not particularly keen on that idea. Yeah, I think I agree with you. I just don't know who that would be benefiting because the poaching Mm. is still Mm. happening. They're not going to care if there's some synthetic horn being made in a lab. There's still going to be... It's not going to be the poachers going to the lab, is it? And be like, oh, hello, can I place an order of (laughs) um, 20 tonnes of synthetic... I don't know. That would maybe fit into the legalisation aspect of the demand still there. And if you legalised it, maybe there would be a need for an artificial supply. Um, Yeah. That's kind of the only place I can see it fitting in. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Emma, what would your kind of overall, what are your overall feelings of whether there are any kind of alternatives to illegal rhino horn trade that are maybe more worth investing in? I mean, I think like you've probably realised in this podcast, it's very, very complicated. Um, but I think, I don't know if this is an alternative or more a way forward that people almost need to realise that a rhino is worth more alive than it is dead. Um, so I was trying to find some parallels between other other species because, say, if you take gorillas, for example, that was a hugely positive example where a shift towards wildlife tourism was able to then generate um, more money to the local people, the local communities, and that was way more than they would get selling the gorilla for bushmeat. But I think it, with rhinos, it's so difficult because you can buy... Um, so a kilo of rhino horn, end users will pay up to $40,000 per kilo and possibly more in some cases. So while rhino horn is worth so much, I don't know if if that could work in the same way it did with gorillas. But I think there are parallels we can draw there. So I think there were, there were lots of charities and um, organisations that visited these local communities and were just helping improve their overall quality of life. So improvements in sanitation, building schools, building hospitals, building wells, um, bringing, lifting people out of poverty. And poverty makes poaching attract, attractive to people. Like, like we've said, we're not blaming the poachers for any of this. It's the situation they find themselves in which drives them to these extreme measures. So I think we need to provide people with alternatives. So an alternative income to poaching. Um, And also just educating people about rhinos more generally. That was something that was very effective with gorillas where they, it was actually these pedal powered um, documentary screenings. So people would be on the bikes and would be powering a projector to show a film about, it was gorillas in that case, but making people realize that they are complex. They have um, sort of complex behaviors and emotions just like we do. And I think especially in children, if they are, lift out out of poverty and then realize that rhinos are amazing that could have a positive um impact because i think we can't tackle this until we start lifting people out of poverty 
So I kind of see that as the the moving forward is you need to address these local communities and give them alternatives um, because otherwise they're not going to care if they're still worried about how to feed their family or getting their kids through school and things like that. I... Um, what about you, Kate? What are your thoughts on alternative strategies and whether, you know, are they are they viable? Is, is Should we put the money there or should we focus on the legal horn thing? Um, well, I, in kind of, you know, academically, I agree that the the ideal solutions would be to alleviate poverty and to educate the consumers at the other end. And I f- firmly believe we should be doing everything we can to alleviate poverty regardless. And I do believe education is fundamentally important to all aspects of life and especially in education. And without educational campaigns, so much conservation work just would not be possible. However, I think in the case of kind of saving the rhino from extinction, we just don't have time to wait for either of those things to work. So I don't think that simply educating people not to buy rhino horn will work because the market is so big that even if kind of 95 to 99 even percent of the market stop buying rhino horn, that remaining one to five percent could still be enough to lead rhinos to extinction. And even educated people get desperate in certain situations and including the prospect of losing a loved one. And I think even if you've been educated that rhino horn does not work and you've, you've accepted that, you've internalised it, you fully believe it, whether that's something you've known your whole life or whether you grew up around kind of traditional beliefs that it might work, you might find yourself in a situation where you've, you've tried everything and nothing's working and so you just think it's worth a go because otherwise I'm going to lose this person. And I think the fact that rhino horn is used for such severe illnesses means education will struggle to work and I completely sympathise with that. So I don't I don't believe that we have time to wait to alleviate poverty because I think there's just not enough rhinos left that can survive that wait and I don't think education will work. And also education doesn't necessarily mean more responsible consumption um, because if you look at the, the kind of example that sprung to my mind was uh, the United States ecological and carbon footprints are the biggest in the world. Yeah. They're an educated company, they, that country, they know <laughs> that, I mean, sorry, I shouldn't say they're an educated country because all countries are educated, but um, <laughs> the US, you know, we know now the impact of <laughs> our certain practices, but we're continuing to do them. So I don't think that education in isolation would work, unfortunately. So I'm not sure if I see a viable alternative that has can work effectively and quickly enough to help prevent extinction i like i like that that point you meant about you know the desperation element of that and that leads quite nicely into okay this question i'm going to frame now how do the ethics of you know if how how do the ethics of not insinuating another culture is wrong and their beliefs is wrong compare with the ethics of legalizing a trade in a project in a product we know doesn't work so, because there is a there is a, a ethical issue on both sides of that, are there? How do you tell people who are different from yourselves in an era where we're increasingly conscious of, you know, how we interact with people who look different from us, our prejudices, both individually as a society? You've got that on one hand, but then you've also got the ethical kind of worry of legalizing a trade in a product we know doesn't work. So, how, how for you guys, how does that how does that balance for you? I mean. I think that the ethical side does get quite um, even possibly even more complex than, than the wildlife <laughs> yeah. side um, is because I do kind of agree that it's wrong to tell people that their cultural practices are, are damaging or causing harm. But I think there comes a point where overall people can agree that the practice is wrong and needs reform in some sense or some kind of ent- intervention. So again, I'm going to throw out quite a controversial comparison here. Um, This is just personal opinion. But so comparison to genital mutilation that happens as a cultural practice around the world. And many people continue to practice this. It's a part of their their faith and their their cultural beliefs. But I think most people would agree that this is an example where intervention is needed because the practice is doing more harm than good in terms of just risk. Of, of health to the person who it's happening to and just the 
the stigma surrounding that and all of that. That's, I mean, bit of a jump between rhino horns and... I completely agree with you. Mm. Okay. It's a bit of a jump, but that was the one that strung to mind. Um, so I think similar to when a cultural practice is threatening the survival of, of a person, when it's threatening the survival of an entire species, I think people need to step in. And kind of, I think this is where we can bring younger generations in, actually. Um, so despite this ethical, traditional thing that has been going on for, for thousands of years, say with Chinese medicine, the younger generations are changing, I think. So we've already seen in China that they, um, sort of young kind of megastars. So one that comes to mind is someone called Angela Baby, who's this big mega star singer actress in China. And she's led several campaigns in support of pangolin conservation and actually telling people, look, this isn't effective. This isn't going to cure your loved ones. Look how amazing they are. Look how they care for the mothers care for their babies and things like that. And this had a huge um, outreach. So I think we can actually change those traditional and cultural practices by changing the, the, the younger generation. I think it doesn't need to be attacking people's beliefs but it's just change through through education i think i know what, what do you I, what do you think roby i i completely agree with you on that regard you know it seems interesting that it doesn't seem interesting i think we need to find a way to rectify in our own moral codes and in our own conversations that we have um how you know it's you know how we morally justify and i do believe we do need to do this you know there are concert there are um aid organizations working to improve the lives of young girls i think in is it uganda or ethiopia who have been genitally mutilated as children and i think that's entirely a worthwhile thing to do i think the most majority of people would agree but you you know you make the note with that you know the use of rhino horn in a traditional culture's medicine is not just endangering a few individuals i know gentle mutilation doesn't endanger just a few individuals it's a vast it's a vast number of people but there are five species at risk here as well um, and i think this actually raises an issue that the conservation in industry in our dialogue is actually consistently underprepared to deal with so i very firmly believe that in terms of you know humane and polite discussion you should respect other people's beliefs as a matter of course i know we all think this we also do need to have a moment where we recognize that some beliefs are actually harmful to global biodiversity so for me in my head the plight faced by not just one species of rhino but five is of such an extent that it justifies the uncomfortable necessity of at least having at least having the conversation of trying to you know change opinions and educate down the line in other places and i i think that's you know the scale of the problem justifies that i don't think the beliefs of a single group of people can be considered ethical if they do threaten the extinction of five whole species that said on a practical level i on a practical and a moral level i don't think it's right to march up to a, a different people and say what you're doing is wrong in in this in this instance because i think you there there we can draw distinctions between different different scenarios um i agree i think actually the best the best way to do it especially considering our history of exploitative intervention in that the west has conducted against south and southeast asia much more effective is as you say you know a rigorous education of young people particularly children um in the value and worth of rhinos and you know population and demographics change as these people who are against the use of rhino horn grow older they will naturally replace their uh, their elders and so the belief pool will shrink naturally as a result of demographic change um However, I do think that methods of belief change may be quicker and more immediately effective if they involve economics. And that's where I think a legalised trade could come in. We, we, could, we shouldn't forget that the, tr the use of traditional rhino medicine isn't harmful if it doesn't harm rhinos. It's only harmful if it involves dead rhinos. If it doesn't kill rhinos, then it's not harmful. And if you can have living rhinos and a thriving traditional medicine market, everyone wins. So that's kind of my take on the ethical conundrum mm. there. What do you think, Kate? Yeah, I actually... Th I don't know what I think anymore. I, <laughs> <laughs> I definitely agree with Emma's point, um, or both your points, that there, there does come a point when intervention is necessary. Um but I think that point comes when harm is being done on people. But actually, 
now that I've listened to what you guys said, I, I can definitely also see that maybe that point also involves the threat to five species. But I think the line of this is very blurry when it comes to the harm of the rhino horn trade on people. Mm. Um, and this might sound kind of crazy, but allowing people to buy rhino horn and the kind of ethics involved in that, it doesn't actually harm them. It just doesn't help them. Um, so if some a desperate person trying to cure their illness takes rhino horn, it doesn't make their situation any worse, except for the fact they've just spent their money. But it doesn't make their situation any better. So the ethics of selling a product we know doesn't work is really blurry because in term, when you're kind of comparing it to the ethics of... What were we comparing it to? Um, oh, <laughs> when we're kind of, yeah, comparing it to criticising someone's culture because we're not harming the people i think the kind of genital mutilation um analogy is interesting because i you know i agree i think that practice is incredibly harmful to people and i don't think it's i think it's something where intervention is there is a strong argument for intervention there because you are kind of actively hurting people whereas the act of buying rhino horn it isn't actually harmful to people but it is actively harmful to rhinos but in terms of the human ethics i don't really it's a really blurry line um i do personally oppose a legal market of rhino horn where advertisement campaigns promote the product as a medicinal product i believe it should be sold as just rhino horn and what people choose to do with it is their own business i don't love the idea of selling a product we we i personally don't think works um, knowing that people will use it in the hope of curing illness, but I also don't think we can say that they can't do it. And with an illegal trade, they're doing it anyway. A, <laughs> That's true. A legal trade gives us greater control of the narrative and allows for more targeted campaigns alongside the product. When it's legal, we can have targeted ad campaigns that educate people on the property of horn. With an illegal trade, we have no idea who is buying it and what for, and we don't know what they're being told. I think the Smoking Kills campaign that we've mentioned before is, is a good example. I don't think it's ethical to sell cigarettes. I don't think we should... <laughs> Sorry, no, I do think we should sell cigarettes. I don't think it's ethical to sell cigarettes. But I don't think banning the sale of cigarettes is the answer because people will just buy them illegally. We won't get the taxation money. Our healthcare system will still be footing the costs of people who get ill from smoking cigarettes. And if we did ban the sale of cigarettes, people would still buy them illegally and they'd be made of God knows what and they wouldn't have the kind of consistent reminder on the packets of the harm they do. Sadly, <laughs> potentially, ethics and legality are not the same thing. And so while I do really sympathise with the ethical arguments of both on both sides, I don't think they hold as much water as the kind of conservation of financial arguments. Mm. I don't think we can tell people that their culture is wrong. And I also don't think we can... But I also don't think we should feed into something that we don't agree with. So I don't think we should just supply medicine if we don't think it is. But I don't think we should sit here and say that it's not medicine either. So I think it's really blurry. But overall, I think with a legal trade, we'd at least have more control over what is being the narrative that is being spun. Whereas at the moment, we have zero control and we don't even really know what's happening. So we know this has been a really long <laughs> podcast, but you know, it's the rhino horn trade. We've got to, we've got to really dig into it. So sorry, it's been so long. This is the last bit, the last section, <laughs> the final conclusion, our opinions. Should we legalize the rhino horn trade? Emma, go. I don't think so. Um, because I think that flooding the market with legal rhino horn is isn't the answer because i just worry the same thing will happen as it did with the ivory trade um where all these people with stockpiled um rhino horns then it gives the idea um that it's valuable again and it could actually stimulate further demand i i think that that is my worry um and also the idea if we legalized it and had a really controlled trade between say African rhino populations and the Chinese medicine hospitals, this again, it fuels the idea that it does actually work and it is being used for curing cancer and things like that. So I think that's dangerous as well that we're spreading that idea that it works, whereas chewing your fingernails is gonna have the same effect. Like I, I that's a good doesn't point. sit I quite, that. quite nicely with me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think, also, there's a risk that 
this trade could basically trigger the demand beyond the point that it could be met legally like we've talked about it takes time for the rhino horns to grow back it could be a year or two years and if there's that waiting period i think people could turn to um illegal poaching even more rampantly um and also i think there's a risk that unless it's legalized everywhere the supply would just turn to rhino populations elsewhere. So like you were saying, Rebbe, possibly with the Asian rhinos, um, which are already like on the brink of, of extinction themselves. Because as sad as it is, the rarer the species gets, the more valuable it becomes. So I think just by legalising it, that almost puts the pressure more on the rarer species because they will be sought after more. Um, and then also, this is maybe a little bit of a odd comparison sorry sorry just really quickly do you mean that legalizing it with white rhinos might put the pressure more on black ones indian ones asian ones so i mean say if we consider yeah the white rhino so that's the most abundant in in africa yeah um in the world yeah in the world so if that's legalized then it's sort of freely available and it's like oh well that's accessible now so why don't we turn to a rarer one because that's more sought after because it's there's less of them um kind of maybe a comparison with that maybe a bit off the wall but like a comparison what about with... if it was sorry legalized across all five species i mean i, I don't do know if that would point. happen i guess it could still be that even in a legal market a rarer one would be more desirable more expensive potentially is that kind of the point you're making yeah so i'll try and explain it with drugs um yeah <laughs> go on <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> I I love this. You are the least, but the person I know who would least be, you know, be able to explain something using drugs. Uh, we'll see. I might not be able to explain it well. I think the best response anyone's ever given me. Let me yeah. explain it with drugs. Okay, Emma. I'll just sit back. <laughs> you tell us about drugs. <laughs> um. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the so in places where marijuana has been legalized on on a large scale, it has been seen in some cases that then people see that as kind of boring because it's it's legal, it's, it's accessible, you can just get it easily. So what happens is they then turn to sort of stronger drugs in a way. So yeah, things like heroin or or those class A mm-hmm. drugs because it's that thrill almost of oh it's illegal, so it's it's more desirable. Like, I don't, does that make sense to you guys? Maybe that's yeah. a bit of a... I do understand the point you're I making. I understand the point, yeah. I think... I've heard conflicting... I've heard conflicting reports about whether legalising marijuana has caused higher drug use. I'm not sure. But only because I don't know about it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I that's just... also an interesting comparison that I've heard before in many contexts of just comparing the legal rhino horn trade to the, the legal trade in marijuana. Um, this is just one example. So, yeah, I, I do... I think it's a useful analogy. I just worry it could shift to more rarer species if it was suddenly legal. And then I guess another concern I have is that if you suddenly have lots of available legal rhino horn, that then this could drive down the price overall and therefore more people will be able to afford it. Currently, I think what's limiting it taking off even further is that it's so expensive and there's only a limited proportion of the world population that can afford it. Whereas if it was legalised, more people could buy it which makes possibly makes it worse um mm. so i i think i'm conflicted because i can see the pros and, and the cons to to legalizing it and conservation does need funding sort of now if we are to conserve the rhino so i understand that having legal rhino horn could alleviate this but i just think it's a sad reflection on society that animals are valued more for their parts and what they can provide us rather than their intrinsic value in an ecosystem um but yeah bit of a rant about drugs and all sorts so <laughs> Roby, what do you think <laughs> blimey well this was a really tricky one you know this has been out of the out of the second series of this podcast this has been the hardest final point that i've had to make at the end of any of really? them I, this was really hard for me wow. um and i really struggled to actually form a it was it was really tempting to just go for an all or broke kind of yes this is what I think I I had to really struggle to find try and find a balanced and nuanced opinion um, so there's going to be as usual with me there's going to be so many caveats um, my opinion on legalizing the rhino horn trade my position is similar to the, my position on trophy hunting which is ish and with caveats 
<laughs> so let me explain. Yeah. I am I am tentatively receptive to the idea of legalizing the rhino horn trade because we evidently need to do something because other if we don't, we're gonna lose our rhinos. However, I have some very strong caveats and very strong criteria that must be met before it's legalized. Um Firstly, I'm not a massive fan of, you know, massive super ranches with lots of private ownership of rhinos for the legal trade. The reason I'm not a massive fan of that is because it doesn't engage the majority of the people in the area who are the most important players, I feel. And it doesn't um, it doesn't do anything active to combat poaching, which we know won't stop even if we do legalise it. So I'm more receptive to the idea of giving national parks and the, in particular, more importantly, the communities surrounding the parks, the responsibility to protect and harvest the rhinos in their land. I think it's better for the rhinos' welfare. I think it's better for the ecology of the area. And I think it's better for the people who actually live in the area. For a large guy like uh, John Hume with all his massive rhinos, I would say to him, um, you've got to downscale and you've got to give off your rhinos to other communities native communities around you and that, that you know that you spread it out like that that's what i would do with on the big scale can i just um, jump in really yeah. quickly so yeah, yeah, yeah. um i don't want to speak on behalf of anyone but i do know from conversations that i've had with john and with other private rhino owners that i do think the community-based management approach is firstly one that they are trying for anyway obviously private reserves do employ local mm. people um but secondly and also you know distribute meat and stuff like that it's also something that i think is very much the plan um with mm-hmm. a legal trade i think the problem at the moment is there is very little trust between rhino owners and pretty yeah. much everyone else including national yeah. parks because i know that some rhino owners are sometimes contacted to do a swap um for genetic diversity with national parks and sometimes they say no which sounds crazy but they just don't trust the national parks with their rhino because they're worried they're going to get killed and so i think mm with a legal trade that trust would be a little bit easier and they'd be able to have this more community-based approach whereas at the moment there is these walls up um which is you know sad and it's not effective and obviously it's, it's a sort of standoff that no one wants um but i can sympathize with the rhino owners because they just they don't know who they can and cannot trust and who yeah. is and isn't a poacher that's really interesting i think i think <clears throat> i'm probably gonna i think yeah i like uh, that's very, that's um a positive a positive thing to consider if there is a general agreeability towards a community based uh, legal rhino horn trade um so yeah that's kind of my opinion ish with caveats and i think when i did livy when i did if i was in control if when i did do this i would do it very i know we have to move fast with this but i would i would do a pilot study I'd implement it in just one country, South Africa, because it's got the most rhinos, with just one species, the southern white rhino, because it's the most numerous. And then I would monitor how this program was working by looking at the amount of illegal rhino horn seized. And if I saw a decrease, then I would say, okay, maybe we can roll this out in other countries, in other areas. So I wouldn't just do a blanket legalisation. As much as tempting as that would be, because we need to save the rhinos, I would, I would force myself to do a slow, okay pilot study then we then we do it elsewhere so yeah that's my position i am categorically not in favor of a blanket legalization of the rhino horn trade however i am receptive to the idea of a community-based community involved joint communal ownership and management of of rhinos because i think that tackles the poaching thing as well Mm-hmm. Just just legalising it doesn't tackle poaching. I think this method might. So anyway, sorry, that was a really long run. <laughs> that is my position, as usual. Not quite as uh, strong as one might hope, but yes. <laughs> Ish, but with caveats, was, was my position. Okay, I'm just going to put my rhino hat on for the... Oh, oh yes, man. Kate. <laughs> Why weren't you wearing this the whole time? Because I thought I'd just whip him out at the end because he doesn't really fit <laughs> over my headphones. This is a treat for our... YouTube, uh, YouTube people. Um, sorry if you're listening on Spotify. I've put a rhino hat on top of. It's my brilliant. Head. If you're just listening, it's brilliant. <laughs> right, I don't lighten the mood. So, my answer to whether or not we should legalize the rhino horn trade, you've probably guessed it by now. I think we should. Oh, deep breath. It's an incredibly complicated issue, and in lots of ways, it's a unique issue um, because a lot of time when we talk about wildlife trade we aren't we don't have this option of 
harvesting a product from a wild animal or a living animal and keeping that animal alive. My personal feeling is that nothing else will work. I don't necessarily think that illegal trade in rhino horn is a good thing. It's not something I ever thought I would have wanted, but I do think I do not think that there is any alternative that does not eventually lead to all other rhinos, all five species of rhinos being extinct. The key thing for me is we're not discussing whether or not to trade in rhino horn. The rhino horn trade already exists and it is one of the biggest and most lucrative international markets in the world. Gram for gram, rhino horn is worth more than gold and the trade is comparable to (laughs) drugs um, and guns. It's absolutely massive and it's happening every single day. We're not discussing whether or not to trade in rhino horn, but whether or not to legalise it. Because illegal doesn't mean it doesn't exist and the illegal trade means rhinos die because criminals do not have the ability to dart rhinos and trim their horns with anaesthetic and vets. They operate under the cover of darkness and with limited equipment. It's inherently unsustainable and demand will and is overtaking the supply. The part of the legal trade that I struggle with is supplying a medicine I do not believe works to desperate people legally. The ethics of that really don't sit well with me. However, this is an issue I've spoken about with lots of conservationists, including people who work with rhinos every day. And one of them said something to me that really hit me, and we've we've said it already in this podcast, is that we should just market it for what it is, come and buy rhino horn. And I agree with him. We do not have to, and we should not market it as a medicine, but just as a rhino horn or just as keratin we can even package it with disclaimers as we mentioned before similar to the smoking kills that there's no scientific evidence that rhino horn possesses medicinal value what people then choose to do with it is their prerogative and although we know some will wrongfully um i based on my beliefs wrongfully use it as medicine who are we to say it's wrong and we do know that it's not harmful while we are legally selling cigarettes which actively cause cancer How can we sit here and say it's unethical to sell a harmless substance to people who believe with, you know, arguably potentially old beliefs that it can help them? I wish more than anything we could end the trade and rhinos could just roam free and live their best lives. I love rhinos so much. (laughs) It's really important to me and I would love for them to be able to live how they were meant to. But I, I, with limited human interference, I just don't think it's possible and I think we would live to regret it if we did nothing Um, and when I say nothing I mean nothing beyond what we're already doing which is a lot the conservation work going around worldwide to help rhinos is admirable incredible and it's so much but they're still dying it's it's not enough and I just I don't think we would I think we'd live to regret it if we don't take firm action and for me this is the only firm action I can see working so that's my take. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, fantastic. We got through it. And we don't all agree, which I think is yeah. fun. I think it's good. I think this, I'm really interested to hear what everyone else thinks, um, especially people who yeah. are new to this issue because it is quite random um, because a lot of the other issues we've discussed in this podcast are really broad, big, global issues. And this is a global issue, but it's about one, five species. Um, it's about one kind of group. Mm. So I think it'll be really interesting to hear what other people think who would you agree with um (laughs) and i think it's really important again to show that we don't always have to agree because at the end of the day we all know that all three of us want rhinos to persist and live and survive and be happy and healthy but i I just think it's nice do you know what my Hmm? sorry but do you know what my goal in life is i have two (laughs) i have two goals in life the first one is to swim in each of the rivers that gave birth to a cradle of humanity, Aww, a cradle of civilization. Uh, so, you know, Fertile Crescent, Nile, Yellow River, Indus, yada, yada, yada. Anyway, the second goal is to see all five species of rhinos in the wild before I die. Me too. So I've, I reckon I've done, I've done Indian mm-hmm. quite a lot and I've done black rhino at a very long distance mm-hmm. through a looking glass. Those are the only two I've got. Fingers crossed we can get to the others and, you know, by before we all die, hopefully yeah. <laughs> That's really before cynical. we die, there will be wild Javan and Sumatran rhinos spreading across mm. South Asia. Yeah, that's yeah, no, also an just... aim of mine. Sorry, I think yeah, they're just so, rhinos are so, so amazing. And I think it's quite nice that we have this 
a platform to have mm. different opinions and we don't all agree which i think is quite nice um so maybe just to end with a little bit of positive news um yes. just a quick news story that happened so was that in 2020 there were no rhinos poached in kenya according to the Woo. kenyan wildlife service which was the first time that's happened since 1999 and also in south africa um that was the sixth year in a row where rhino poaching incidents had fallen so just Woo. some positive news to end on there like kate said there are some really really um, there's amazing work going on currently um and we need to kind of applaud that but more needs to be done i think is kind of my ending message <laughs> yeah um well thank you so much for sticking with us through that we know it's been <laughs> a long and bumpy ride um we yeah. would really really love to hear from you guys um so definitely leave us comments um on what you guys think um of this issue um and if you are looking for more biome content you can head to our website which is uh the biome project hyphenated uh, .co.uk and all of our social media will be linked um in the description so you can find us there um and if you want to find more from us as individuals um we're all on instagram so Ro, do you guys want to say your instagram handles i'm uh at roby watkinson wildlife uh on instagram i'm emma hodson wildlife and i'm conservation kate so thank you so much for listening and we will see you next time see you next bye. time bye <laughs>